Hi, welcome back to an introduction to anatomy and physiology. We left off talking about one of the four major types of tissues in the body, connective tissue. And as I mentioned, there are six different types of connective tissue. The first one that we talked about was loose connective tissue. We then moved on to adipose tissue, which is fat. And we finished the last podcast with fibrous connective tissue. We're now going to talk about the fourth type of connective tissue, cartilage. Cartilage contains an abundance of collagenous fibers in a rubbery matrix. That matrix is made of chondroitin sulfate, which is a protein carbohydrate complex. You may have heard of chondroitin sulfate because it's advertised on TV as a supplement used for improving arthritis. Chondrocytes are the cells that really produce cartilage. They secrete collagen and the chondroitin sulfate. Cartilage is strong and flexible, and we find it in shark skeletons. As we discussed before, chondrichthyes are made of skeletons almost entirely of cartilage. We also find it in different places in the human skeleton, especially in joints and in places like the cartilage of our ears and noses. Our windpipe also has rings of cartilage which prevent it from collapsing. Fetuses of most mammals begin out begin primarily as cartilage, and as the fetus develops, more and more of the cartilage is replaced by bone. However, when they're born, they still have a larger percentage of cartilage in their skeletons to help them get through the birth canal. Once the baby is born, more of the cartilage is replaced by bone, and in fact, a baby is born with more bones than it has as an adult. The next type of connective tissue is bone. Bone is mineralized connective tissue. Osteoblasts are the cells that make bone and they form a deposit of collagen in their matrix. Included there are calcium, phosphate, magnesium, and they combine and harden within the matrix and form the mineral hydroxyapatite. The combination of hard minerals and flexible collagen make bones harder than cartilage without being brittle. It's important to remember that our bones are somewhat flexible. If they weren't, we would break them often just from doing things as simple as jumping. The last type of connective tissue we're gonna talk about is blood. Blood is unique because it has a matrix of plasma. Plasma is a liquid. It contains waters, salts, dissolved proteins. There's two classes of blood cells, erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, and leukocytes, which are white blood cells. We will talk more about those when we get to the circulatory system. Included in the plasma are particles of cells called platelets that are involved in clotting. After connective tissue, the third type of tissue in the body is nerve tissue. Nerve tissue senses stimuli, transmits signals from one area to another. This is a very high speed form of communication within the body. A nerve cell is called a neuron. And as you can see from the diagram, the cell body contains the nucleus and there are multiple branches coming off of those. Those branches are basically called processes or extensions. And there's two types, the dendrites and the axon. The dendrites transmit impulses coming into the nerve cell and the axon transmits impulses leaving the nerve cell. The fourth and final type of tissue in the body is muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is composed of cells called muscle fibers. Muscle fibers contract when stimulated, usually by a nerve impulse. The cytoplasm of the fibers contain contractile proteins, actin, and myosin. Muscle is the most abundant tissue in most animals, Muscle contractions account for a lot of energy used. In vertebrates, there are three types of muscles. Skeletal muscle, which is voluntary. We control the movement of our body using skeletal muscles. Adults have a fixed number of muscle cells. When you do bodybuilding or weightlifting, your muscles get larger because you increase the cell of the size, the size of the cell, not the number of cells. If you also notice from the picture of the skeletal muscle cells, they are striated because they appear striped under the microscope. Cardiac muscles are in the wall of the heart. 
they are striated and branched, and we only find cardiac muscle in the heart. The ends of the muscles have intercalated discs. That causes them to relay signals from one muscle cell to another in the heart. The third type of muscle we find in the body is smooth muscle. There are no striations in smooth muscle, and we find it in the walls of organs, like in our digestive tract, in our urinary tract, also in our arteries. These cells are spindle-shaped, and they s contract slower than the other types of muscles, but they remain contracted longer. Obviously, they are involuntary because we don't control their contractions. They help to move things through the organ systems of our body, food, urine, blood, etc. Let's talk about organs. Organs are different tissues organized into organs. And they contain mesenteries, which are sheets of connective tissue that suspends the organs in the body. This way they don't move around. If it wasn't for mesenteries, your abdominal organs would be in a pile at the bottom of your pelvis. The mesenteries are moist and oftentimes are filled with fluid. There are different body cavities and in yourselves and mammals, the thoracic cavity is the chest cavity and contains the lungs and the heart. The abdominal cavity contains the liver, the digestive system, the urinary system, the reproductive systems, and the two are separated by the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a sheet of muscle that separates the thoracic or chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. When you have a spasm in the diaphragm, it causes hiccups. There are several different organ systems, and in most textbooks, it will tell you that the human body has 12 different organ systems. Each organ system combines a bunch of different organs to work together to, to perform a specific function, such as digestion or circulation or breathing or reproduction. So these are just some examples of the different organ systems in the human body. One of the most important things that your body needs to do to keep you healthy is to regulate your internal environment. A big player in regulating the internal environment is interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is the internal environment of vertebrates. It fills the spaces between cells. It's where nutrient, nutrients and waste are exchanged between tissues and the blood vessels, specifically the capillaries. Your body needs to constantly maintain an internal environment in order to keep you healthy. That is called homeostasis. Homeostasis is environment. A homeostatic control system has three functions. There is the receptor, which detects a change in some variable of There's the control center, which processes that information from the receptor and directs a response by the effector. And the effector performs the response, and this may be something like a muscle or a gland that does something in response to the change. An analogy is a thermostat. The thermostat in your house would be the control center. The thermostat in your house contains a thermometer, which is the receptor that measures the temperature in the room. When the thermometer reads out of the range that you have your, thermo your thermostat set to, it triggers the heater to go on and off, so the heater would be like the effector. This is a type of negative feedback. Negative feedback is when a change in the variable being monitored triggers the control mechanism to counteract further changes in the same direction. What negative feedback does is it prevents small changes from becoming big ones. For example, sweating controls your body temperature. Positive feedback, on the other hand, is a change in a variable when a change in a variable triggers a mechanism that amplifies the change. In other words, it causes the change to continue to get 
An example is a baby's head on sensors near the opening of the uterus triggers contractions which cause more pressure. That in turn causes greater contractions which in turn cause greater pressure and so on and so forth. Eventually, positive feedback brings childbirth to a completion. This type of feedback maintains a steady state. Usually with positive feedback, some type of climax or endpoint is reached and then the whole situation resolves itself. The last thing we're going to talk about is medical technology. With medical technology, we have been able to see medical, uh, I'm sorry, we have been able to see internal structures beginning in 1895 when x-rays were the first way to see them. High energy radiation passes through soft tissues and you get photographs on film which show shadows of hard structures. Some of the disadvantages is that you can't see soft tissues. They are 2D over images that overlap each other and large doses of radiation can cause cancer. However, modern x-rays are lower dose radiation and have more details of soft tissues. A second type of medical technology for viewing internal structures is the CT or CAT scan. This stands for computed tomography. It is a type of x-ray. It produces thin cross sections of tissues and can be used to detect small differences between normal and abnormal tissues. Another type is MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. This does not use x-rays. Basically, it works due to the behavior of hydrogen atoms and water molecules. In a magnetic field, and the magnet in this machine is turned on once you're in it, um, the magnet causes all the hydrogen ions in the water of the body to face the same direction. The MRI lines up all the hydrogen atoms with a pulse of radio waves knocks the hydrogen atoms out of alignment. That pulse of radio waves actually causes the hydrogen atoms to release radio waves which are picked up by a scanner and turned into a computerized image. This, unlike x-rays, works very well with soft tissues that contain a lot of water, but bone and denser tissues are almost invisible because they contain lower amounts of water. Finally, the PET scan PET for positron emission tomography is used to view different levels of metabolism in different tissues. Patients are injected with a biological molecule like glucose that's labeled with a radioactive isotope like radioactive carbon. The cells are then metabolically taken up. I'm sorry, the cells metabolically take up the glucose. The radioactive isotope, isotope releases positrons which are positively charged particles. Those collide with electrons inside the cell, and that in turn causes a release of high energy radiations, and the PET scanner detects that and picks it up, creating an image. What it shows is metabolic activity in, for example, in the brain. High levels of metabolic activity could indicate cancer, because cancers are cells that, are, that reproduce very rapidly. Low levels of metabolic activity could show areas where a stroke or Alzheimer's um, affected the tissues and those tissues aren't really working anymore. Um, so those are four different types of medical technologies that are used to view internal structures. This ends our introduction to anatomy and physiology. The next podcast that you should be watching is the one on the integumentary system. Bye.